Now the three variations that you need to know are the rundown office block, telephone instructions and when an ordinary man gives the instructions. Now the spec says that you need to know this in order for you to be able to identify situational factors that could encourage or discourage the obedience levels. Now we know that Milgram carried out a lot of different variations, 19 variations in total on his basic experiment. Now what he's trying to do each time is determine exactly what it is that's increasing or decreasing the levels of obedience. So apart from the one change that he was making, the one thing that he was manipulating, the independent variable to see if it had an effect on obedience levels, everything else from the original study was kept the same with the same standardised procedure. And this was a control that Milgram put into place to ensure the cause and effect relationship between the IV and the DV. Now Milgram was able to conclude that there were two ways in which authority could be obedience to the authority could be reduced. Milgram suggested that increasing the obviousness of the learner's distress, so being incredibly aware of how distressed the learner is, potentially the learner being in the same room as you, would decrease the levels of obedience as measured by the number of volts participants were willing to go to. And also reducing the authority or the influence of the experimenter, so removing the lab coat, making him an ordinary person, changing the environment from the prestigious Yale University Okay, the first variation that we're going to look at is when an ordinary man gives orders. So, an ordinary man who appears to be a subject um, is the one who directs the instructions to deliver the electric shock. So, there are three subjects, two of them are confederates or accomplices, so they're in, in on the experiment, and they arrive at the lab. The rig drawer is exactly the same, ensuring that the participant will always be a teacher. The naive subjects of the participant... Uh, we'll always have to read the word pairs and administer the shocks to the learner. The experimenter goes through the usual instructions, straps the victim into the electric chair, gives the sample shock to the participant. However, at no point does the experimenter indicate which shock levels are going to be administered. So at no point does the experimenter say, you are going to use this electric shock generator to increase by 15 volts every single time the participant gets the, the word pairs wrong. Now a telephone call then happens and the experimenter has to leave the lab. The experimenter indicates before departing that the subject should go ahead with the experiment until all of the word pairs are learned perfectly. As the experimenter leaves, the accomplice, or one of the confederates, announces that he's just had a really good idea and that he thinks that they should increase the shocks by 15 volts every time that the participant or the learner gets a question wrong. So you can see on the picture here, there's no experimenter in the room, the setup is exactly the same, but instead the ordinary man, or the participant thinks is an ordinary man, who is just the same as they are, taking part in the experiment, sits on the, where the experimenter would sit and dictates the instructions and comes up with this amazing idea to increase by 15 volts every time. Now, I'm sure you can imagine there is a sharp drop in the obedience level. 16 out of the 20 subjects broke with the common man. That means they refused to carry on, despite his insistence that the experiment should be continued. And he actually came up with a really persuasive argument to try and make them retain and carry on with the experiment. So only a third as many subjects followed the common man as followed the experimenter. So from here, we can start drawing conclusions about the fact that obedience is when it is an authority figure you know we we obey authority figures but we're not as likely to obey an ordinary man or somebody who we see as having equal status or equal authority as we do when what we're being asked to do is a destructive obedience task okay the second variation now is where milgram kept everything the same but he just changed the location so he took it away from the prestigious setting of yale university and he put it in a rundown office block and he wanted to see if that made a difference so the aim was to see whether the obedience would dis uh, decrease if it wasn't in yale university if it was in the office block um the office block was actually in bridgeport it was away from the university completely it was supposedly by a private research company and it was in a downtown office Participants were allocated the role of the teacher in the rig draw and they were asked to give the shocks to the learner when they gave an incorrect answer, standardised procedure. They were prompted by an experimenter if they did not give the shock, however, the experimenter was not wearing a lab coat. Now in this situation, obedience dropped massively, dropped again to 47.5%. Now, Milgram concludes from this that obedience decreases in a less prestigious environment. So he argues that the presence of the lab co and the Yale University as a prestigious environment obviously had a really positive um, effect on the obedience levels in the original study. 
Now, this would be, could be because the environment was seen as less legitimate and the participant was less likely to be intimidated or less likely to be in the agentic state because they didn't feel like the experimenter was somebody who was willing or able to take responsibility for the actions as much as, say, an experimenter or a professor in a university would. So you can see on the picture here, there's no experimenter in the room. The setup's exactly the same, but instead the ordinary man, or the participant thinks is an ordinary man, who is just the same as they are, taking part in the experiment, sits on the, where the experimenter would sit and dictates the instructions and comes up with this amazing idea to increase by 15 volts every time. The third variation that you need to know about is much shorter than the first two, and this is simply telephone instructions. So everything else stays exactly the same, the standardised procedure. The only thing that's changed is this time the experimenter is giving their instructions over the phone. Now, in this situation, the obedience rate dropped to 20%. This is the lowest of the three variation studies that you're looking at. Milgram concluded from here that people are much more likely to follow orders when the authority figure is present. But when the authority figure is in a remote location, it's a lot easier for people to obey. I want to take this second just to remind you of social impact theory, which very much supports the findings of this variation. That idea of proximity, um, and proximity will increase levels of obedience if we apply social impact theory to obedience, is proven here in the sense of you are much more likely to obey when the experimenter is in front of you than when the experimenter is over the phone. Now, you could get a whole range of exam questions on Milgram's variations. You could, have to, you could have to discuss the three, compare the three, compare them with the original study. You might be asked a question where you're asked to determine what factors affect obedience, and obviously you would talk about the variations to help that. Or a nice simple one I've shown on the screen now, outline one variation study for five marks. Now, if we look at evaluation of the whole th of the, all three of the variation studies, it's still got practical value. It's still explaining this destructive obedience and the Holocaust. And if anything, the variations are helping us to explain this in a little bit more detail. We've talked about the fact that the original procedure must, procedure must be reliable because it can be replicated consistently within the variations. Strong controls are being put into place by Milgram all the time in order to ensure that control that cause and effect relationship between the IV and the DV. And this is giving us greater insight into the conditions in which people will obey unjust requests or complete destructive obedience. However, as we discussed looking at variation number two, it's low ecological validity, they're not in their everyday setting, it's got low task validity, shocking someone is not a likely event that we would do in real life. Uh, the instructions passed on by the experimenter that the participant would come to no harm is unrealistic in relation to the Nazi guard who would have known that his behaviour would have caused pain and distress. So we're arguing here how applicable is this study? How, how much can we use these studies in order to be able to explain obedience like the Nazis when actually the situations were quite different? And the ethical issues still stand from the original study. Just a very quick table, this isn't actually on the specification, but I just want you to be aware of this, that there are very cult there are cultural differences within obedience where Milgram's study has been replicated by other psychologists in other countries. Now, as you can see on the screen, Australia seems to have the lowest levels of obedience, particularly in females, whereas if we actually look, Germany does still seem to have stronger obedience levels than Milgram's originally study, original study, which was conducted in the USA.